<laughs> it's so good. <laughs> it's really well done. We got in contact with the VFX supervisor at Scanline VFX. You have the normal challenges of these gigantic creatures that you know need to convey like this massive scale. Fun fact, Scanline VFX does more than stick shots. I gotta know, I gotta know, is the stick real? This episode is sponsored by Skillshare. Stick around to the end to see how you can get 30% off your annual membership. Hey, welcome back to another episode of Visual Effects Artists React. We're going to be joined by a special guest today. We're going to talk about some crazy CG. I'm sure a chunk of you have seen Godzilla versus King Kong. Most importantly, <laughs> we're going to get to the bottom of this puddle about the stick. Wait, I'm a little out of the loop. What's, what's this stick? So when we did the uh, episode of Freddy on the Snyder Cut, there's a scene of Steppenwolf walking through a puddle. Oh yeah. Oh. oh yeah. That's a 3D puddle right there. Oh yeah. You think people would be impressed by the CG character and we'd be talking about that, but no, we, we were talking about the stick that he steps on it and whether or not it's CG. Wow, cool. That's <laughs> really interesting. Very excited to Look, find out more. it's very important, Sam. <laughs> it's we're the most important out. shot out of the entire four hour movie. Okay. Sweet. <laughs> Quick clarification about that. We accidentally attributed that shot to Weta Digital. They did a lot of work on that movie, but the actual company who did that sequence was Scanline VFX. And we got in contact with the VFX supervisor at that company, and he's gonna give us the real answer. Fun fact, Scanline VFX does more than stick shots. They <laughs> worked on a lot of Godzilla versus King Kong and many other films you've seen. So I don't wanna undermine them too much by just <laughs> saying they dealt with this one stick. Look, if that stick is CG, they deserve an Oscar. Best actor, stick. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Sticky. <laughs> stick and wolf. I am a stick. <laughs> If she's not dead, you tell her to come down here. You tell her to come down here, walk right up to me, and kiss me on the- Kiss you on the what? Death Becomes Her. It's about these two women that are basically immortal. And Bruce Willis, back when he used to do a lot of comedy, and was really good at it. Wait, that's Bruce Willis? <laughs> yeah. It is! Yippee-ki-yay, mother- <laughs> So, ILM, now they just did T2, or they're working on Jurassic Park. And this comes out, and this was like a very groundbreaking VFX movie. I just want you to know one thing, Hell. You brought this on yourself. Whoa! Okay, that was a sweet stunt. That was a great wire like, pole. Like what, a wire pole? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, today really shaped up and hurried into this. You know, did you ever notice how some days can start out? So well, shitty? here it is. Oh, what? How did they do that? Just suddenly. It's so good. <laughs> it's really well done. That, that's, that's a well-designed shot. It's so well done. How do you think they did this shot? My guess is that that body is an animatronic body. And they did two separate takes, one with her actually going up into frame and then leaving frame, and they, they merged those two shots together. I think that's 100% true, especially if you look at the motion of her hair. It looks a little strange. Yeah. It's a little funny looking. Yep, nope, you guys are exactly correct. So it's actually a puppet. It's a puppet on wires. And there's no head and they're sticking a blue screen element of Goldie Hawn as she does the action onto that shot. The puppet actually just has a funnel for a neck, and so they just pour the water into that, then it comes oh. out the stomach. <laughs> a very doable and approachable shot. If you can match the lighting, and you can match the you know film stock contrast, mm -hmm. it's a really doable shot. Yeah, this doesn't require a huge amount of CGI skills. This requires a lot of effort on the pre side of things, you know, the pre-production, actually getting the model side of things, a good camera crew, a good on-set visual effects supervisor, to make sure the lighting matches up. So in this shot, Meryl Streep is just standing there with her head there. Her entire body's on a blue screen. And this element here with her head back like that, that's another element they've filmed separately. And you can even see when she throws her head yeah, forward the blue screen Yeah, you can see like the, the, the rough haircut on the mat. It's really basic effects. And there's a little bit of like funkiness going on in the neck where an artist is going in there and basically like stretching out imagery to get the like the neck texture to like line up. There's definitely some rendered skin there though. Where her neck actually lines up with her shoulders, that's all CG. ILM, this is like their first skin shader. They have a bit where literally her whole head gets lifted up off of her neck and it's like her neck stretches. Yeah, look at that neck. Look at that neck! <laughs> <laughs> look at that neck! <laughs> you also coke, dude. <laughs> 
Ilum, apparently, uh, this was the precursor to a lot of the shaders they developed for Jurassic Park. It was literally their first skin shader. It holds up really well. Like Surprisingly so. It's, there's yeah. not a lot of visual effects from this era that truly hold up like this does. Time and time again, the examples where we say, this one holds up, it's usually an ILM shot. Yeah. ILM was like <laughs> the masters through the 80s and 90s. And yeah. it's only been in like the 2000s and later that other VFX warehouses started really matching their skills. VFX warehouses. <laughs> VFX warehouses. <laughs> I don't know what I said. You said VFX warehouses. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, no, it's okay. It's a Renism. They're usually called houses, not warehouses. I know. But you okay, know, whatever. Fair enough. I've always called them warehouses. <laughs> Cause, maybe it's because we work in a warehouse. We, we're, we, we're working in a warehouse. We're a VFX warehouse. Any beer building is a warehouse. I wish to ply my wares for yeah. you. <laughs> Any house with wares is a warehouse. <laughs> <laughs> Hey guys. Well, Brian, thank you for uh, taking a time in your busy schedule to virtually sit down with us and uh, chat a little about visual effects here. As you probably know, we were gushing about this scene with Steppenwolf walking through a puddle and stepping on a stick. <laughs> <laughs> and we uh, accidentally misattributed it to Weta when we should have been attributing that scene to Scanline. Like, who, know, who knows, right? Like, it's not <laughs> like burned into the film, you know? <laughs> Do you know how long it took for the post-production side of that scene to take? Our schedule for doing everything for Zach's version was seven months. About a month of it was de-archiving the old show and trying to resurrect it. We were done with the beach torture before we were done with the project. So I'd say five months is a good guess for about how long we spent on the beach torture. Okay, that's pretty incredible, like how fast you guys turned that around. Yeah, the schedule for that, you know, was pretty crazy and it was pretty exhausting to do. And like, as we were finishing, I was joking like with all my supervisors, I'm like, you know, good, now that we're almost done, let's never do this again. <laughs> <laughs> we're all arguing here over whether or not that stick was real and whether or not that puddle was real. Because it's like he's a CG character interacting with what looks to be real, so obviously that can't be real. You can fake it to a certain degree by having like boots walking through the water, but what ends up happening, I feel 99% of the time is that VFX studios end up just replacing all of it and doing their own simulations. But this looks so real, you don't even think twice about it. The puddle is real, although we did add some additional interactivity to it. At one point in time, there was a version of the puddle shot where we we did a whole replacement, but Zach, he liked the stride that Rich the Stuntman had done. So the, the final version that's in Zach's movie, it, it's a combination of real puddle and CG puddle as well. So at some point you're literally like fading between the CG render and the real footage, as opposed to just replacing the entire puddle to keep a level of consistency. Yeah, yeah. Wow. <laughs> that's crazy. I'm betting that the stick is real. I, okay, I gotta know, I gotta know. Is the stick real? Sticks in the photography. Oh, oh it is real. real! It is real! It's too good to be fake. I mean, it makes the, sense the to me. The puddle interaction with the giant foot, though, like, you can't just have a small foot. You'd have to replace the whole foot. No, you simulate the larger foot with the initial ripple, but the thing is, it's not like huge stomps that are gonna create Godzilla waves. You can still mask that off. But, like, some of the mud comes up out of the puddle, too. I love the wet sand on that sequence, and I constantly was talking about it with the effects supervisors, so I think it's funny that we're talking about it. You guys at Scanline, good job. Yeah. Good job with your wet sand. A shout out for the wet sand physics. <laughs> I love the wet sand. <laughs> yes, <laughs> exactly. Please, Please consider, consider subscribing. We'll, we'll never, never do, do that, that again. again. <laughs> Sorry. Oh boy. I can't keep a straight face. Uh, All right, the boat battle was rad. This is such a masterclass in CG animation. So many physics simulations happening all over the place. The amount of water interaction in physics, I believe that was a thing that Scanline was kind of known for, or like really helped them I guess, kind of get their reputation in the industry. I'd say that's a true statement. Like, like one of the things that Scanline had going forward early on was their proprietary fluid dynamics solver called Flowline. And especially at the time, you know, that, that was pretty early on for doing a gigantic ocean simulation. The company itself has a strong background in doing these large scale simulations and destruction work. This shot's so cool. 
And I love how they like, they hold it and they stay locked and <gasps> you get him breathing right there and then goes back under. I'd seen the scene in the trailer, but I didn't realize that they're gonna have a whole bit where he, like he's literally stuck to the underside of the ship upside down in the water. It adds like an extra sense of tension here. What would you say was the biggest challenge about that entire sequence? You know, you have the normal challenges of these gigantic creatures that, you know, need to convey like this massive scale. But the arena that they're fighting in is also dynamic, you know, because like the ships aren't fixed. They're on water that they can be on top of or below. They both end up on the carrier and like, you know, whether or not the carrier could support their weight, you know, like we could, man, probably not. <laughs> but it also, it, it's seesawing and it's, you know, creating ripples that go out and gigantic splashes and then aerated mist in the air. And they're both at that point, they're both wet. So they are also dripping water. And, you know, at that scale, you have to consider what are drips and what is mist. At the same time that they're fighting, they're destroying the aircraft carrier and the, the planes that are on top of it. I love the detail how when they're fighting, the actual ship rocks backwards as they lean on it. Is somebody hand animating the boat first and then basically taking motion capture and hand animation for Kong and just kind of lining them up by hand and then starting to work physics simulations around that? Or is the boat itself like physically driven? We would start off actually and just keyframe out animation for the creatures and the boat together. And then we would do simulations around that. We wouldn't drive the boat with buoyancy simulation and stuff yeah. like that. Because now if the boat is being simulated from buoyant forces, now that's going to affect the animations of Godzilla and King Kong as well, causing you to have to go back and change those <laughs> keyframes key on those. Yeah, it makes sense to kind of just to keep a level of consistency there. Yeah, yeah, get stuck in a feedback loop. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> We did the big three-way fight at the end between Kong and Godzilla and Mecha. In the big shot where Mecha grabs Godzilla and drags him along the ground, I, I think in that shot, we destroyed like four dozen buildings. And all the buildings we built like with construction history so that they had, you know, concrete and metal glass. And we put office furniture or apartment furniture inside any of the buildings where you would see it. When the monsters go in, the furniture comes out. <laughs> yeah. I love how each shot is long enough where you can actually like take in what's happening. I think like as, you know, a director slash editor and even a visual effects artist, it allows you to really demonstrate your work a lot better because you're not going to catch a large scale simulation like this if your shot's only like a second or two long. You have to watch it for like 10 seconds to like see the effect unfold. Now, when you have a scene and you have skyscrapers collapsing and the ground getting torn up and office furniture getting blown out of the rooms in the, in the skyscrapers, how do you get all of these pieces to actually exist in one scene together? I imagine at a certain point you are limited physically by how much memory a computer can have to hold all these different objects. As much stuff that you can separate out, you do. Like if the buildings aren't interacting with each other, you don't have to simulate them together, right? Like this little cluster of buildings is one thing, this other one, uh, another thing. But to your point, yes, memory management is like a big problem. Whether it's all of these collapsing buildings, you know, like you have Kong with all these like gazillion hairs with debris on him and being clever about scene management and memory management it is the only way to get through it. At this day and age, we are reaching a point where there's incredibly complicated things happening on screen and there's so many different systems built to emulate things from real life, you know, water and fire and smoke and muscles and fur and all these kind of things. In your opinion, where does that line or that goal of trying to achieve photorealism diverge with the goal of trying to make a very cool painterly dynamic image? Where do you find like that split where exists for you? I think the answer to that question lies within the character of the film. There's definitely other films and other directors that I've worked with who, you know, you show them something like, this is what it would look like. And they're like, you know, that, like, that's cool that that's what it would be. But like, I find that very boring. This should be much more epic. Yeah, you know, and even Pixar does that too. It's like there's a mix between making something look real and also making it look good. Because sometimes real doesn't look good. You know, I certainly have my opinions about things and stuff, but like, like ultimately the work that I do and the work that our teams do, it's, it's in service of the filmmaker and the film that they're trying to make. Fascinating. Thank you for uh, answering that question. And uh, thank you for taking some time at the end of your long work day to spend some time with us on this show and answer some questions about visual effects. It's really cool to be able to talk to the, the yeah. expert and the people behind the work, you know, versus us just 
kind of guessing on the couch here. It's and saying that the wrong company did the work. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Kudos to you and everybody else at Scanline for the amazing work you guys have been doing. And we've talked about many of the different pieces you guys have worked on on the show, and we will continue to do more so in the future. All right, well, well, thank you guys. All right, so long, Brian. Thank you. Thanks, Brian. See you. All right, bye. Hey everyone, we have really exciting news. For the first time in over a year, we have posted another great short film on the Corridor channel. This one's special though, because it has a lot to do with things you've seen on this show. Things like virtual production, Unreal Engine, motion capture. We've combined them all into our second full short done in Unreal Engine. It's called The Cut Scene, and you can watch it right now on the Corridor channel. I think it turned out really well, and it represents over a year of trial and error and research and hard work to try and figure out this new form of filmmaking. Go check it out on the Corridor channel right now. We got links everywhere. Hit it. All right, let's do this. Everyone open fire! What movies from the 80s and early 90s still hold up today with their visual effects? Let us know in the comments. Do you like to learn? Of course you do. You're watching this channel. We teach you all about things like visual effects, stunts, animation, and a whole bunch of other stuff in between because we are always learning all the time as well. And one of the ways that we learn is by doing tutorials and classes online. Now, if you are looking to get into that, there is a site that is specifically focused for teaching. So there's no ads, no algorithms, nothing like that to worry about. And that place is Skillshare. You might think that here sits on a couch, a man who does crazy visual effects with crazy physics simulations. But what about making a pizza? Well, Skillshare has me covered with an excellent pizza making class. So whether you're trying to just get better at something for a hobby, you know, you're like your guitar playing kind of sucks and you want to learn some new chords, or you are trying to improve your skills for your career and you want to go out there and land a gig doing editing or illustration and, and so on and so forth. Well, Skillshare has you covered. It's not the Matrix yet. You can't just download Kung Fu, but you can get pretty close. Just takes watching a couple of videos and some practice. So head over to Skillshare.com to get started. The link is in the description below. First thousand people to click will get 30% off their annual membership. And if you are already a member, you can even use that link to get 30% off your next annual membership there. So it works for anybody, whether you are a new user or a returning user. All right. Back to the episode. Thanks again to Brian for coming on the show. I really want to have more guests on the show to kind of talk about the actual behind the scenes knowledge that goes into making these movies. So subscribe for more guests. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the end. Theme. <laughs>